Uh, okay, thanks uh, to the organizers. Um, I uh, attended last year to this conference, it was really interesting. This year is the same, and I hope uh, it keeps like this for the future with uh, more and more content. So brief introduction about myself. I'm original, originally from Argentina. I did there my PhD and about 10 years ago uh, in the area of uh, condensed matter physics, a uh, program with Fortran code. Uh, after that, I came to Europe, uh, also in Italy and then in Belgium. And after that, I moved to the outside the academia. I started working at Shell for about two years as a consultor for the Fortran code they have there to, to model the subsurface, subsurface. And it is now since uh, about four years that I work at Marin. I'm going to talk today about uh, one of the codes I maintain and I developed, uh, which is called Sika. Uh, well, what Marin is, uh, Marin is uh, an institute in the Netherlands. It is a non-governmental and non-profit uh, institute, which means that uh, it's, not, it's not like a company. And uh, it's, uh, well, it has big facilities uh, for testing, experimental tests and scale models, uh, things like this. But uh, it's much more than that. It has uh, about 400 employees. And uh, well, it has, it, it has um, uh, active research and, and it works in, in many different areas or related to the maritime world. And in particular, SICO, uh, the code itself and all the investigations, uh, which uh, results of investigations which are present in SICO, uh, belong to, to an association which, which is called uh, CRS, Cooperative Research Ships. And it, it is pretty uh, unique. Uh, it exists since about 50 years. And uh, it, it con yeah, it, it, there, it, this association consists of more than uh, 30 different companies and institutes for research around the world, mostly from Europe, uh, some from uh, the US and most from Australia. Every year, these uh, companies and institutes put money for, for doing research. And their people can present the research projects into the boat and then they decide what to do with this money. Um, so the user group of Seagull uh, lives inside this community. We have there uh, uh, about uh, 15 institutions using Seagull and more than 50 users. The development team uh, of Seagull uh, are all people from Marine. Uh, well, as you see, it's not a big team. I will show in the next slide what more or less each of us is doing. Um, what SQL does? Okay, so SQL is, uh, first of all, a uh, frequency domain uh, linear 3D uh, code. Uh, it works with uh, potential theory, diffraction theory, uh, with uh, that's the basis, and then it has a lot of advanced method to deal with uh, non-linear effects like uh, let's say turbulence or things like that. Uh, essentially to, to have a brief understanding then you have a ship and the ship uh, is a rigid body and can move this six degrees of, of, uh, of uh, freedom and you have uh, waves coming in in all directions and when you, what you want to want what we want to know is uh, the reaction of the ship to, to, to those excitations. And the reactions are motions, acceleration, forces, all, all kinds of things. So to, to study that on the theoretical side, I'm not going to show any uh, formula today. There is no time for that, but uh, there is a basic method which is called zero speed green function where the ship itself is modeled with panels. I will show that in the next slide. Uh, and then you can calculate responses. A more advanced method, something we included recently in the PhD thesis of Tim Boney, one of the developers. Uh, it's including some sort of interaction with the water around the ship. Uh, you, you will see what I mean next. Um, and traditionally, the users of this code are um, um, naval architects or naval engineers, so not really much experience with Linux. 
So the user community was up to five, 10 years ago, mostly on Windows. And there, well, what you want to, to study typically is like uh, different uh, coming waves from all directions combined with uh, different ship speeds and frequencies of those waves. And typically, a simulation will take like 12 hours on, on four CPUs. And this, this can be typically done on Linux, uh, sorry, on Windows, on your own PC. Uh, if you include those water panels around, well, then it takes much more time, still doable. But uh, why this is still alive and around, because this is somewhat old theory, but this is because mostly the alternative, which will be CFD, and have big patches there in computational fluid dynamics. Uh, if you want to do a similar study only for one of those conditions, it will take uh, already one and a half day with a full cluster. So if you want to perform a similar uh, parameter study or parameter space study, like, like with this other theory, well, imagine it would take uh, 9,000 uh, times um, more time. So, Briefly, this is uh, well, how you describe the ship uh, and on the colors you see here the motions. And this is, uh, these are the results uh, you can get uh, using CCAL. Uh, these are typical plots, like in this axis, you have this heading uh, coming in into the ship from all directions. And in this axis, you have the, the frequency. And um, well, this is the excitation you get. This is typically known as the response amplitude operator. This means like uh, you have a, an incoming wave of one meter, and this is how much the, the ship will be excited. And this is at zero G, but you can calculate the motions and solution at different uh, points around the ship. And of course, uh, there is more motion or there are more acceleration where there are some sort of resonances. And then if you increase the velocity of the ship, uh, whether well, that, that sort of uh, resonance would change. That's what you want to know or improve your design. Um, this more advanced theory included water panels. Uh, and this is what you will get. This is only for visualization. Uh, this is the incoming wave in one direction. And then you have like different components like uh, diffracted waves and the total pressure all around. And this one is the radiated uh, waves uh, generated by the ship itself. So let's go now to the code itself. Um, well, um, CCAL, before CCAL, there was something else. And there were, there were many other codes that we were uh, merged or some features from one code were taken and things like that. Uh, so those are the predecessors, we can say. Some of them really old for 77, 10 years ago, some sort of modernization, then new features from other codes uh, from, from Marine. So the biggest step was made by Ed Fondale, one of the members of the team 10 years ago. He wrote uh, in a really smart way, I would say, a code generator where we, dis we have an input file, XML file, where we decide what the inputs uh, should be, but also internal variables, the code generator can read it, it's written in Python, and will generate automatically Fortran structures, Fortran code, and, to, and also some simple subroutines to initialize or um, remove or add uh, uh, um, charts to these kind of structures. Because it was written, written 10 years ago, this is all, Fortran 90 code, so we are stuck with the, with these pointers in order to get rid of them. In total, uh, I would say we have around 100 uh, files. Uh, larger files are in the order of 15,000 lines. We try to keep them small also for compilation time, to reduce compilation time. We are using external libraries, HDF5, Fox to handle HDF, H, uh, sorry, XML files. DGNS, which is a form, format related to computational fluid dynamics, and well, MKL for, for the linear, linear algebra. These are some of the file formats SQL uh, is using for input, uh, some intermediate files, some output formats. So now a bit uh, inside the code itself. So it is hybrid because. Uh, uh, it has MPI parallelization and inside there, OpenMP parallelization. Uh, well, the code runs uh, 
So different stages, typically those uh, different loops will be divided like this. The Hagen loop will be over the condition what I showed before, like uh, the ship speed, the, the wave direction, and uh, you can see the, the wave uh, frequency and some other company, some other sorry, input. And then the inside loop will be typically over the ship panel. So uh, depending on how much, how many panels there are, or how many input conditions there are, we split it uh, on MPI and also on open MP. I will show some more later on this. Um, okay, sorry a bit for this uh, busy slide, but uh, this is just to show that uh, while we are using CMake, we have a really good experience with this. We can set, uh, Compile, compiler uh, flags, the, the links to external libraries, things like that, uh, really in an easy way. Uh, because we are using, because we are maintaining the software for Windows as well as for Linux, then we need to be careful and with all these uh, compiler options, how to treat them, they work differently in, in the, these two systems. So for example, to name one, uh, on Windows, you need to really set this stack variable, which is the amount of memory you want to use for the stack. And this will be used at runtime to allocate uh, temporary arrays for, for open MP parallelization. So if you don't have a good number here, you will get uh, some random crash. The same uh, history on Linux work a bit differently. There it's done at runtime like this. And uh, Okay, then also uh, compiler flags in different format, but uh, also on Windows. And at the moment we are using Microsoft MPI. Um, for, for using it, then you need to link to it like this. Uh, we tried also Intel MPI, and for that you need actually to overwrite some of these uh, Microsoft libraries. So this is all done with CMA. A bit, a bit, uh, uh, inside the MPI parallelization. So, uh, well, first of all, in Linux MPI is always, I find it more advanced than the Windows version. So we can really use the latest uh, module for it. While on Windows, yeah, also support is not that uh, extensive, I would say. If you look at the forum or things like that, there's much more or less information. Uh, that's why at the moment we are using like this, and this is also split because uh, this goes inside every child routine using MPI, while this goes on the header of the module. Well, this is very simply simple implementation where each MPI rank will decide on, on the basis of, of the distribution if it has to run or not certain input condition. And you see here the same variables I showed before, like the number of velocities, frequencies, or the wave variations. And these are the functions we use to, to split that. An advanced feature we use, which actually is really easy to implement, is a share memory, which uh, saves a lot of memory. I will show you also this in a while. On the OpenMP part, which uh, as it is now, this is on the left side, but because we move or we use OpenMP in the lowest level we can, then the, those loops are actually really easy to read. Very simple like this. You only need to ensure that this uh, subroutine uh, call inside has to be thread safe. So this is the same here. <laughs> On the right side, this is only a, side, a, a note apart. Before moving to MPI, I actually implemented the uh, OpenMP at high level. And then, what well, this is how it will look like having OpenMP at that higher level. And uh, this is really, yeah. It's, Complicated, complicated because um, uh, well, first of all, it worked fine, but then you need to use flags like uh, give, uh, override compile time, and I don't remember now how it is called. But to really give more time to the compiler to to parallelize the code, otherwise we will not do it. Other problems we will find is like not all developers are familiar with this, so they cannot really touch the code here inside. Uh, some other uh, not so good features, I would say, about the language is like uh, you have many definitions like this, and this uh, has an implied save uh, hidden, not many people know about, but that's a problem for OpenMP. A uh, missing feature is uh, 
I showed you before, we have these kind of structures. There are no really ways on OpenMP to get local copies of these things. So you really need to do it manually, like um, defining some extra arrays. So imagine if you have a lot of code and you cannot just uh, change the code like that. So you really need to, to do these kind of things. Um, running on Windows MPI looks like this. Well, the code line, uh, most of you might be familiar with this. Uh, uh, it's, it's with the MPIX uh, script. And then you can kind of uh, monitor this parallel execution with, uh, for example, the process explorer, and then you will see. What is different on Windows is that you need to use this extra um, program as well, which will kind of set uh, the configuration from, from allowing uh, running MPI on Windows. Uh, our users, well, imagine, as I said before, our users are um, now an architect or engineers, not really much uh, IT background, not all of them. So, well, they find already these things a bit complicated. On the Linux side, uh, we maintain uh, uh, two versions because people outside the Martin need to compile the code themselves. So we have Intel MPI or OpenMPI with GNU compiler. Also, code line is different uh, for OpenMPI. You need also to add this because otherwise the default is that only using one single socket in the chip. So you have all this kind of HPC environment uh, parameter and behaviors that you also need to kind of control and give or, or tell to the user what to do. Um, you can see here uh, uh, the effect of uh, MPI in the practice, the, in particular the shared memory. Uh, this is one of the biggest matrices we are allocating. It depends on the number of panels. Uh, and we can see with top, here, this 1.2 giga is in the JR column, and it is exactly this matrix, which is shared by all the MPI ranks running on the same uh, node. Uh, and okay, a bit more on the memory. So, sort of one of the points we need to be careful about is the memory, because yeah, okay, I will call this is parallel, hybrid parallel, and MPI, OpenMP, this and that. But uh, at the end, uh, each of these parallel processes will use uh, memory and uh, this amount of memory in use will depend on the number of panels. It's not really easy to, to have a, a clean formula of how much memory the code will use. So of course, I will show later how we are handled that, but uh, sometimes we get requests like my code is crashing. Okay, why? Is it a real bug? Uh, are you running out of memory? And I find myself Porta is not really providing at the moment intrinsic uh, functions or features to, to kind of monitor the memory. While I would say more than 90% of all Fortran codes probably have this type of issues. And, and uh, always you want to resolve better, or you want to get better precision. So it means you store more points or more memory at the end. So how we deal with this, where well, we implemented also by hand uh, some memory monitor at runtime. And if the users have some problems with memory, we tell them, okay, switch this uh, on and uh, let us know how the memory is used, how much free memory you have. And uh, on win Windows and on Windows, oh, sorry, on Windows and on Linux. On Linux, we actually read the, get the process ID and read on the system, uh, different columns and, and with that we create this sort of table so we can see what the peak is and in windows is also similar but not completely but uh, okay you got the idea i think so some of the problem we have here is like uh, okay it could be that uh, there is still uh, memory to be used but say at a given point you want to allocate uh, one single big array well it could be that then that this free memory is not uh, contiguous, it's some fragment or something like that, then the code will just crash. Um, some other comment I wrote here to mention is that, uh, yeah, I also find myself that the language should provide some some facility. For example, you say you, say you have an, an recordable array or a matrix and you want to, to make it bigger, change the size actually, but you, the best way to do it now, as far as I know, 
uh, correct me if I am wrong, is using move alloc. But this is already four or five lines of, of code. Uh, it would be good to have like one code line, let's say, well, uh, you know, this array, I want to add one of a few elements just on the fly, like with one call line. Uh, the next topic to discuss, uh, and I have a few minutes, is uh, well, five formats. We were using uh, four files, like one per condition, but we discovered after implementing this that we ended up having just like too many files we have too many conditions and this also occurs a lot of disk space this is really big problem uh, on some clusters so we are now in the process of switching to hd5 where each uh, mpi rank will have its own data so each of these files will look like like this so you see here you can use uh, uh, attributes or, or actually see the data stored inside the file this is the hdf uh, uh, view um, there are other related problems to this or something you need to handle which is um, well if you know you as you normally would do with the board files opening and closing them repeatedly or too fast this uh, is well time consuming and also it what you get is also a sort of fragmented file with a really huge uh, file sizes, so nonsense uh, huge. Um, okay, one of the last slides, and I'm okay with the time. So again, well, it's all fine because it's parallel, but now you need to run it. And how will you choose uh, how many MPI or how many MPI per node or how many open MPI? And as I said before, depend on what your users are. In this case, uh, yeah, our users don't really care much about this. They just want to run the call and they want the call run fast. So we need to help them with this. So the decision of what's best for this uh, is based, depends on the number of conditions they want to, to, to study and how many panels they have, but not only of that, also on the hardware, because uh, you know there are different chips around with, with the, memory and things like that so for example just to give you some rapid idea uh, increasing the number of panels this is some estimation we made for how much memory the code will use and in one of the clusters we have it's like okay we know if we use large queue because you know in the cluster you might have different queues yeah, up to 60,000 we can use all of the cores uh, in one node on mpi but after that, not. And if you go to another queue, which is normal, which has some less memory, this table also changes. So at the end, what we have now is some uh, sort of pre-check mode where you can run uh, SQL quickly and SQL will analyze all these inputs. You can also give the hardware, um, the features that you are going to use, and um, with that, SQL will create for you a job file that you can actually use uh, for running the real simulation, typically in the room, but also on Windows. Because, uh, as I said before, we are also using on Windows. Uh, well, these are typical performance plots. The performance is not really good. There is not really much we can do about this, but uh, well, that, that is what it is. And um, I think I am finishing now. These are some fancy results we get. Uh, this is a very flexible jeep. It's not really realistic, it's only for research purposes. And again, uh, you have here different uh, times. How it is it's flexible, so you see how this uh, uh, passing wave is, is moving the ship. And I think that's it. <laughs> I go now away with my summary. Thank you very much. So Okay, uh, I can read some of the questions. The other, maybe you can check. So I'm gonna start with Tiziano. He's asking, did you consider using Core A, Fortran? And uh, no, no, and uh, to no. Be honest, so you went not... directly to MPI. Yes, yes, and uh, to be honest, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not really a feature. I like Core mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't think it fits the language, but it's my personal opinion. Okay, 
Okay, but you are using new MPI. So, well, was my, one of my questions. So you are using shared memory MPI. That that's great. Okay. Yeah. And then Arian is suggesting this is not a question actually. He's suggesting that Intel One MPI is a tool that you can use to analyze the program memory, uh, program behavior actually vis-a-vis -vis memory. So. So Intel has this functionality that I assume should we, work on Windows and Linux as well, right? Uh, uh, I do have experience with Intel tools like Inspector, mm -hmm. and they are really good. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is like running on debug mode, you know. And sometimes yes. real problems you need to get. Uh, okay. not, that the users will not debug the code. They just need also to get the information that. In release mode, kind of. Yeah, but also in this respect, I I agree with you that it must be some functionality in the language. And well, I'm using also the, the version that you are doing with the PID and fetching the amount of memory of the program. But mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Brad say that have you tried? I mean, this is as, again as to read the this is the array notation. So maybe can uh, you mean the modern four? What exactly do you mean? Yeah, I'm asking down Brad to open the, the, the microphone. Maybe you can ask that to you. Otherwise, you can read the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I just put a, put the example syntax for appending yeah. items to an array. You can use the array and the square brackets. And add and more put, elements. Mm -hmm. And add more elements yeah. in, a, in a single assignment statement. Yeah, OK, but um, you show we have these uh, structures with child. So I'm not sure you can use those there. but. Uh... I will yeah yeah no if if using that syntax it will reallocate the array on the left hand side to include the additional elements okay okay it's uh, new to me thanks mm -hmm. and yes then emanuele is suggesting some ideas this is again on the chat how to write more combat code for matrices and arrays and it's put in the link or the discussion portal line discourse and then, yeah, yeah but can you please elaborate more about your opinion on, on useless or core arrays? That's already you gave the answer, so fantastic. So then I will ask if there is any question on, on people can, you know, just open your microphone. And I assume no other questions. So thank you very much for your presentation. And we go to the next speaker.